Hello and welcome to today's webcast brought to you by Fire Engineering and sponsored by the good people at Honeywell. Today's event, The Art of Go, No Go, will be presented by Mike Galliano, captain with the Seattle Fire Department. A little bit about our sponsor, uh, Honeywell First Responder Products is a leading manufacturer of head-to-toe personal protective equipment for first responders. Each year, Honeywell provides scholarships for FDIC International, and this year they're sending 20 students to the 2017 show in Indy. You can learn more about them at www.honeywellfirstresponder.com, and you can visit them at the show this year if you're coming at booth 1610. Now a little bit about Mike. Mike Galliano has 29 years of experience with the Seattle Fire Department and the U.S. Air Force. He's a captain of Ladder 5 and a member of the Seattle Fire Department's Strategic Planning Leadership Group. Mike has written numerous fire service articles and is the co-author of the best-selling book, Air Management for the Fire Service, and the SCBA chapter of the Handbook for Firefighter 1 and 2 from Penwell. Mike is a member of the Fire Engineering and FDIC Advisory Board. He's a director for the Fire Smoke Coalition. That's firesmoke.org. And he's on the advisory board of the UL Firefighter Safety and Research Institute and teaches across the country on air management, fire ground tactics, leadership, and company officer development. And along with Mike Dugan, Mike co-hosts the popular fire engineering radio podcast, The Mikey G and Mikey D Show. And he also partners with his wife, Ann, on firelife.com to teach on strategies for developing and maintaining a strong marriage and family. This presentation is both live and, and interactive, so you can ask questions at any time by clicking on the Ask a Question button in the presentation window. You can get a certificate of attendance for this webcast, but you've got to stay online until you see the congratulations screen pop up. If you have any questions about that, please just use the Ask a Question button below. If you're running pop-up blocking software, you need to disable it to view the webcast. And in addition, it's recommended that you close down all other applications for better performance. For your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of the live event. And we'll send a reminder email message to everyone who registered with a direct link to the archive. But you'll also be able to get at it from the uh, homepage at fireengineering.com. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mike Galliano. Mike. Well, thank you, Peter. I, I appreciate it very much and um, so grateful for all my, my fellow firefighters, my fellow practitioners of this amazing, amazing calling that we've all been blessed to, to partake in. Um, you know, man, thank you for hanging out with me for a little bit today. And my sincere hope is that uh, by the end of the day, uh, you've picked up a couple more things you can add to your toolbox a couple more things that will help you at O Dark 30 when you're out in the lawn and, you know, you're by yourself and there's nobody to look to for what the answer is going to be of what tactic to choose or, or whether we're going to commit or we're not. I hope you get a few more things that will help you in that in that arena. Um, that's what this was all about. That's why, that's why I started to put this class together, and uh, I sincerely hope you, you find it helpful, that it resonates. And as importantly as anything, I really hope that it resonates with you and that you take it back to your organization and you train your companies with it and you find some things in here that will be helpful not just for you but helpful for fellow brothers and sisters that are on your crews that are going to be running these fires with you. It's going to be just as critical that they're able to make good quality decisions as, as it is for you to make them. Um, I would just real quickly, I also want to thank Honeywell. Um, I'm very grateful for just all the effort and all the impact and support that Honeywell brings to the fire service. And, you know, it, it, nothing is more indicative of this than the FDIC scholarships. And if, if you participated in that, if you had the ability to put somebody up for that, I've had the privilege of, of being at the dinner last year, and, and, I'm, and if I can do so, I'm going to go to their dinner this year where the scholarship recipients all hang out and are recognized. And what, it, it's just, I mean, it's rubber meets the road, incredible um, stuff from, from Honeywell to pay, I mean, full ride, man, to pay for firefighters from across the country to come and experience 
the only way you can experience FDIC is to come to FDIC, and it'll blow your mind and you know and, and rock your world. Uh, and you know, I, I recognize it's it's not cheap. It's uh, it, it's expensive, and um, you know, some departments don't fund uh, many firefighters to go. And Honeywell stepped up and said, "We're going to pay for twenty." And man, um, if, if nothing else, I, I hope here's the way you can thank Honeywell: swing by their booth at FDIC, go go and tell them thank you. Go, uh, my buddy James Strohecker will be there. Go 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 say hi to James and tell him that Mike sent you. And that whatever the good giveaway is, whatever the good freebie is, give me one of those. <laughs> okay? Uh, but yeah, just uh, 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 firefighter safety, um, it, helping us out, great tools. Um, we're going to use the, uh, the Honeywell mask. We're going to use their FCBA at the uh, Rescue Air demo where I'll be and Mike Dugan will be looking at the firefighter air replenishment stuff. We could have picked any FCBA we wanted, and we went to Honeywell to get the SCBAs to use at that. So anyway. Um, I really appreciate the sponsorship. Would not have been able to do this at all if uh, if they had not been sponsoring it. And so, thank you very much, Honeywell, and we'll uh, we'll rock on with the art of go no go. So very simply, um, I only I have less than an hour with you today, and um, I'm going to try to at least as best I can. I'm going to try to give you an overview of this process of decision making on the fire ground, and I want to clarify what this is. We're not going to talk a lot about tactics today because I feel like tactics are very much a local issue. They depend on so many things. Um, to include, you know, st a lot of stuff we can't control, who the leaders are, who the chief is, who the chief of ops is, who the, you know, who's the movers and shakers and all of that type of stuff. They, so they will determine a lot what our equipment is, what our staffing is, what we get for uh, training. And so tactics is very local. I get a chance to speak all over the place. And, you know, what, what we're able to do in Seattle Fire with our staffing versus the types of things that are able, are able to be done with people that only have three, four, five firefighters showing up, that's going to be a little bit different tactically. And obviously the more people you have, the more assignments you're going to be able to give. And, and those types of things really impact tactics. This is going to be for essentially that that whatever it is, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, of you, you've gotten some information as you're showing up to the fire, and now you're unseen. And you're getting your first real glimpse at what the problem is, what it is that you're about to tackle. And my hope is that from the moment you show up, you're starting to pick up some cues about what's going on in the fire, and those cues are going to lead you to an overall impression of what's happening at this fire. There are similarities to, to all fires, but none of them are exactly the same. And, and, you know, they're burning in different places, different types of structures. The weather may be having a different impact. But there are a thousand things that can be going on at your fire that are a little bit different than the one you watched on video or the last fire you went to that may have been similar. They may have all been in a rambler. You know, maybe the last two fires you've been in may have been in a rambler or they may have been in apartments or whatever. But there's variables that are different. I believe very strongly in a cue-based firefighting approach. I, I, I'm telling you, man, I hate checklists. I hate command boards. I, that, that stuff all has a place, but it's, it's much deeper into the fire when, when chief officers are there. You know, and God bless our chief officers. I'm so proud of them, and I, and I, I love all, all of our chiefs and, and my friends who are chiefs. But that's a particular job. And, you know, you get to, you know, stand at the command buggy and, and be all comfortable and all that type of stuff. And that lends itself to things like command boards and checklists and all this other stuff that probably got most of us promoted but really doesn't have a, a significant place in the first three to five minutes of firefighting. Now, I know people will disagree, but you're here listening to me, so, you know, I'm going to tell you what I think. And my feeling is, and it always has been and it's proven out over, you know, now 30-plus years of doing this, and 30 plus years of doing it, not behind the desk. You know, I had a couple years at the training division, but but I have basically I've been on an engine, I've been on a truck, um, and enjoyed you know just all of it. And I'm blessed right now to be on, you know, ladder five, fire station 31 with engine 31 and ladder five and medic 31. You know, one of the finest firehouses in the country, man. One of the greatest places to be. And rolling out on a fire truck is what I have done. And showing up at incidences and making decisions has pretty much been what I've done my whole career. Now, looking at cue-based firefighting, let's just look at this just to warm you up. I don't know what you're doing. I, 
I see my uh, I got my uh, brothers and sisters at Station 38 at Engine 38 just popped me a little note that they're watching. Tony, um, you, you folks have a safe ship, and I hope you get a rock and fire. Maybe it'll be this one. Should we go inside? That's going to be probably the most critical decision as a company officer that you're going to make. And we can't take it cavalierly. Um, we have to be thoughtful about it. We have to be aggressive about it, or, or nothing's going to get done. But just as a little warm-up, with, with those that you're watching with, um, you know, if you're sitting there by yourself and you've got a little scratch pad, just look at this photo and, and name a few cues that you see. What are a few things that pop up if you're setting up on this fire that, that maybe jump out to you firewise? And talk about that a little bit. Talk about that with the people that are, that are sitting with you or, 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 or that you have on your notepad. What's the first thing you see? What's the first thing that jumps out? Now, as you, as you, as you write that down or you think that thought, or you share that amongst your fellow firefighters there, um, likely everyone is going to see something a little different as their first thought. And that's okay. That's, that's the way your mind's wired. That's the way your experience level is. One of the cool things about doing decision-making, the way I'm going to describe to you, is that you get to kind of focus on your strengths and let your strengths really work for you and then identify where your strengths maybe don't lie, the stuff that you don't know as well. And, you know, and let, me, let me just tell you, I, I'm not a building construction guy. You know, I don't build in my off-duty time. That's not my skill set. I mean, I can go out with the guys and I can you know, pound nails when you tell me where to go and all that, but that is it, just not something that comes naturally to me. Some of you are you know, building whizzes, and that's what you've done, and you have construction companies and you know, all that stuff. It's going to come very naturally to you. That's okay. I have to work at it. Where you don't have to work at it so much, I've got to work at it. I've got to go and I've got to get that information. I've got to take classes. I have to really learn that stuff, whereas for some of you, it comes naturally. Um, look, look at this picture. What do you see? What's, what's the first cue? Um, you know, I've done probably now hundreds of these classes, and, and uh, people will identify that potentially we've got fire that has self-vented through the roof, that we've got the two compartments there below where the fire has vented looks like some type of collapse has happened. And, you know, I would always ask you as a first order of business to get you warmed up, what is the rescue profile? What is the survivability profile in those two primary compartments in the center on floor two where the fire is vented through the roof? What's survivability profile? Is anybody going to live in there? If the answer is no, and I would hope that, you know, the majority of you, that's the direction you go with that, that the survivability profile, at least from what we can see, we can't see depth, but from what we can see, looks like there's going to be nobody alive in there. And at least for those two compartments, we can pretty much write those off as they're, that's going to be a water job, right? We're going, to, we're going to put however much water we can put into that. We're not protecting property. We're not saving lives. And that kind of cuts the building up a little bit for you. Early on in the fire, even in the city of Seattle, we're resource deficient. We'll have one rig, two rigs, you know, and, you know, you look at this fire. How many assignments do you need on this fire to do an excellent job? And I'm telling you, it's more than the two or three that a couple companies are going to do. But as an incident commander on the front end, as you're making your tactical decisions, you have to decide where you're going to put those initial few precious resources. And if, if you're just going down a checklist, if you're going down, you know, what it was that got me promoted, where, you know, you just call for everything. I'm going to, I'm going to lay a primary line. I'm going to lay a backup line. I'm going to lay a backup line to the backup line. I'm going to get a vent plan together and, and look for some type of uh, probably – you know, vertical ventilation combined with a robust search on both sides of this. Well, <laughs> you know, I hope it doesn't take you too long by the time you got the helicopters and the SWAT teams and every other thing you call in to try to get your lieutenant's bars. I hope you recognize you've run out of bodies about three assignments ago. And that's just not the way the fire ground works. It's why, it's why the checklist mentality for fighting fire, fires, I just do not believe, works. It's an interesting way to train. You can, you can learn some stuff training. But you really have to be cue based. You have to, the whole idea of recognition prime decision making is critical if you're going to make quick decisions and not just spin around in your juices. Uh, some of the other cues, and, and I've got to move on for this. We, we, we're, are, we're very limited on time, so I'm going to move at a fairly good clip. But you, just the type of occupancy. We see businesses down below. I'm sure most of you see that we're going to have some kind of access issues and maybe forcible entry issues. Um, it, the potential for this fire running along the, the cock lock. And certainly, we look at the, the fact that it's businesses below with maybe one open, you know, just below the video sign there. 
But also, what about above? Is there a very good chance that we've got people living in this thing? And we, we see these all over the place. Um, we do have a p- real potential life hazard up there, and their, their access may be, may be desperately cut off, and they're going to need help from us. Uh, you've got parapets to deal with and um, overhangs, you know, backside cable overhangs, you know, with signs and heavy stuff that can really mess up your day. But all this is is a warm-up that all these different cues are going to lead you to an impression of what's happening with this fire and what we want to do is try to narrow that down so that we can make the best decision possible with the information we have. Nothing is going to give you a perfect decision, and when instructors tell you that, um, you, you know right there that you're being sold some snake oil. What we try to get to is the best tactical decisions that we can, and then once we make those tactical decisions, we then evaluate them based upon what we see once they're put into play to see if that ends up being the most effective option. If we get additional information, additional data, additional cues, folks, that is going to be a, a indication to maybe chain up, change up our, our uh, strategy, change up our tactics, okay? Um, here's a, here's a uh, I just got a, just got a checklist question, and, I, and Tim, I appreciate the, very much appreciate the question. This is from my buddy Dave Rhodes, and, uh, you know, I, I, thought, I thought this was kind of funny. You know, uh, we, we had these checklists, you know, to, to fight fires out in the street since, you know, since I've been a firefighter. I remember the first one was coal was wealth. That was the first one as I was going out to tactics classes, and I was trying to, you know, figure out what in the hell, how, how do you get started? Here's the problem with, with things like coal with wealth or RECO or and my buddy Dave, if you'll notice, he put Rome in there, the air management acronym. I appreciated that. You know, it's, it, it, it's all this different stuff. And I, I like that he says, uh, you know, Slicer, Dicer, Spicer, ah, hell, Omaha, Omaha. You know, Audible, Audible out. Uh, here's the problem with, with uh, things like Recio and that. They don't trace, they don't track what act, the way fires actually go. If you've been to fires, let's face it, are there times when, you know, Ventilation is the first thing you do. Yeah, the times when rescue is the first thing you do. Or, you know, the times when access is the first thing you do. How do you how do you get a checklist or something that kind of traces the path of what a fire might actually do or don't do? And as you're looking down at your checklist, as you're running through your checklist, are you able to focus on the cues of the fire and really identify what's happening with this fire, not with the one that you did in your promotional board or you did it did with your exam. So here's what I did. I, I never found that, you know, Recio Vsaw was what I used. They're old Recio that everybody knows. And then in just in a way of trying to, you know, make it make sense to me, I tacked Vsaw on the end of it, ventilation, salvage access, and, and, and water supply. Um, you can see that they start to get really long after a while as you try to identify all the different things that are going on with the fire. And that's why coal was, coal was wealth was so long. I tried to sit down and in this, this quick decision-making model that I'm so fond of, and I, and I love reading all these books on this stuff, books like, like Blink and, and, and all the stuff that Gary Klein's putting out, the normal accident stuff, and um, just trying to identify how it is that we make decisions and why. I, I just came up with a simple framework that works for me. Now, let me, let me just be clear here. If Recio Vsaw works for you, Please keep using that. There is no model that is the, you know, is the end all, be all. Um, if if coal was wealth, if, man, if you can cycle through all that stuff, God bless you, and it's working, and and the fires are going well. Please keep using that. I, I am so tired of instructors putting something out and saying this is the only way to do it. If you don't do this, you're an idiot. That's not true. If you don't do this, you're not an idiot. It just didn't work for you. This really works for me, and as I've been teaching it all over the place, it seems to be resonating with, with firefighters and helping them to get from I'm on scene, the air brake hits. Now I've got that big swirl of emotion and energy and all the crews are coming down on me and I have all this stuff happening in front of me and the fire is burning and I've got to start, I've got to decide, I've got 20 tactical decisions that I can make. I've got to narrow it down and to narrow it down, you've got to start tossing things out and start getting to the one or two or three things that you really can evaluate and say, I'm going to do those. I feel like when I'm at fires, this really helps me to get to that point. And these are the three. 
Now, how I view these, and it's, and it's difficult, you know, to say over a over a podcast. It's difficult when I'm not looking at you. But as you look at rescue profile, building profile, and fire profile, basically what hangs in each of those are your experiences. And so, what do you know about rescue profile? What do you know about evaluating a building for where people might be? Uh, where have you found people before? What information are you getting on the outside, maybe from the homeowners that are maybe directing travel? What type of occupancy is it? Where do people, you know, in that occupancy, maybe where do they live? At what time of day is it? Those types of things. That all falls in the rescue profile. I force myself, when I pop up to the building, I force myself to get my eyes. I, you know, you, you recognize the fire. You recognize some aspects of building construction. You'll cycle between these three, these three things the entire time you are fighting the fire. You'll go back and forth between them. I try to force myself to get my eyes off of the fire, which I'm just like the rest of you. The fire's talking to me too. You know, it's, it's whispering sweet love words in my ear and calling me by my secret name that only my wife and fire knows. And, you know, you, you can lock in on the fire, you can lock in on the smoke, and that's all you see. I force myself to go to rescue, and, and you'll see why as we move into it. And then I cycle through, and I, and I cycle through the entire time, just trying to look at cues, read cues, trying to figure out what exactly is going on with the building. So let's dig in. The rescue profile, uh, essentially, that's what are we trying to say. And that will really go a long way. Please hear me on this. That will go a long way towards the helping you decide what level of risk you're willing to take at the fire. And uh, if you are not making those evaluations, I think you're headed for trouble. Listen, you can you can close this right now and stop this presentation right now. If your if your baseline is that building's on fire, we're going in, rock on. You don't even have to listen anymore. You've got your decision making process already in tow. You're just gonna you're gonna go in no matter what's going on. I think the decision making process is much more nuanced than that. I am telling you, I have a group of men and women who run with me on my fire ground that I care very much about, and we are willing when it is appropriate to give everything we've got to the emergency and have made those decisions, have risked our lives numerous times. I am down with that. That's what I signed up for. But I also recognize as a professional, you know, some of you, many of you, have probably been to more fires than I have. Some of you haven't been. But I've been to a few. Over 30 years, I've been to a few. And I can tell you, not all fires are created equally. Some are meant to be fought on the interior as aggressively as we can go. Some are meant to be a little bit slower. And some aren't meant to be fought at all except outside and watch the thing burn and they'll put something new there. That's the reality, and that involves decision-making. So let's just get warmed up and let's look at rescue profile. Here's the question. What are you willing to risk to save a life? I think you should answer that before you go to fires. You should process that in your head. You should think about the men and women that are on your crews, and you should think about your duty to the citizen. When you put our badge on, you accepted a sacred, a sacred, sacred responsibility to the citizens to, to at times, it's necessary, you're going to have to put your life on the line. What are you willing to risk to save a life? I'd like you to answer that. Think about it. One word or two words. What are you willing to risk? When I ask that question in classes, I usually get uh, what, what we were kind of raised on. We're willing to risk what? To save a lot. We're willing to risk a lot. Um, other folks might say, well, I'm willing to risk my life. And then eventually as we talk about it and we dig into that, the answer truly is, yeah, I'm willing to risk my life, and I'm willing to risk the lives of my crews. I'm willing to risk the impact and the horror that losing a firefighter is going to cause to everybody involved, to the people on the fire ground, to the fire department, um, man, to the, to, the, to the family that, were, that sent them off that morning and were hoping that they would come home. I think it's important that you start to process some of that. And I don't say this to, to keep you from going inside when it's legitimate. That, that's what you signed up to do. Where it starts to help you when you actually talk about things honestly is it gets you to, is this fire that I have in front of me, maybe it's the first one you've had in a couple months and so you're raring to go, is this fire that I have in front of me, is that a fire that I'm willing to risk everything? And my answer, when, I, when I'm asked the question, what are you willing to risk to save a life, and, and I would qualify that a known savable life, what am I willing to risk? I'm willing to risk everything. I'm willing to risk my life. I'm willing to risk the life of, of Rick and Jimmy and Jason and John. I'm willing to risk the life of Mike and John 
and Dave and Chris on the engine um, and all the other folks that are coming in that were making the decision to go do that. And I know all them, gang. I know their wives. I fellowship with them. I know their kids. Many of them I know their fathers. There's going to be a serious loss if I lose those guys in a fire, and it helps me to modulate the risk for those ones that maybe aren't so clear, that are not a known savable life. Helps to take that to take that just go, go, go away, and now we're attacking the fire in an appropriate manner, in the right manner. So let's look at the rescue profile and some cues. Here's the first thing I think of. As I look at the fire, I, I get my initial assessment. I try to get my eyes off the fire. If you will ask yourself this question on the front end, I think it will go a long way towards getting you out of, I've got 20 options in front of me, and start to narrow it down. This is the narrowing down process. Are there survivable spaces within the structure? Is, is there a space within that building that would support life, that would make it worth having a big risk modulation to, to go through? So here you go. Uh, you know, you got to put one in here for the truck captains, one that's a little bit of a softball. Here we go. Is anybody alive inside that structure? At least this, at least the part of the structure that you can see, is there any chance that anybody's alive? Now, I'm going to talk about this from a, from a on-the-fire ground kind of perspective, and I'm also going to talk about it as a trainer, because I want you to be able to take this back and train your folks. Sure, we can't see around the back, and if you are going to limit yourself to always waiting for the perfect picture or the perfect video to try to train, you're never going to train because those perfect pictures and videos, they just simply don't exist. What we want to do to try to get our sets and reps up by looking at good fire pictures, looking at good fire videos, going over after action reports and line of duty death reports and all of that stuff, we want to draw whatever wisdom and whatever cues out of these pictures and videos that we can get to just enhance our slide tray a little bit, to make our to make our intuition, if you will, a little better, to, to have seen it even though we weren't there. That's the point. And as we look at this, you know, it's pretty simple. Is anybody alive? Nobody's alive. If, if we get around back and there's an extension on the back or maybe we've got a lower basement, shoot, maybe, who knows, maybe our, our thought process changes. But on the front end of this, we know that what we're looking at is pure and simple a water job. We're going to put as much water as we can on that, and we're going to move on. So think about it. Are there survivable spaces? No. What does your risk, your willingness to risk do when you see this? Now, and I would hope you're, you're saying in your mind, my risk, which if there's a victim, I'm, I'm willing to risk everything. If there's not, all of a sudden my risk starts to shrink. As your risk starts to shrink, your tactical options start to shrink. Case in point. When you showed up on this thing, all you heard was there's a house fire with flames visible, multiple reports. You're thinking rescue at that point. That rescue and search is one of your tactical considerations. Now as you pop up to this, it's like, well, search is out of, off the board. You know, ventilation's taken care of for sure. This thing's vented as much as it needs to vent. And all of a sudden, your, your tactical options start to narrow down. And what was 20 and, and overwhelming now becomes two or three. That's the way cue-based firefighting starts to help you get moving quicker in, when you're out in the street. So let's look at another one. If we could get the video rolling there. Okay, so hopefully I'm hopefully I'm back with you. Um, you know, just I should have told you on the front end. Well, once the video starts running due to the 
the way the software works for the webcast, I can't really talk to you in the middle of it. So um, you're going to have to kind of pull the cues out yourself. But let's just let's think about this fire for a little bit. Nice little typical bread and butter house fire, not a big deal. You've been to, you know, most of you have been to many of these. Right on the front end, as you looked at the very front of this structure, what were you thinking about fire-wise? I mean, the fire got your attention, right? And it was, it was blowing out of the, the front window. You could see it was deep it, all throughout the roof, venting through the roof, venting through the gable. I mean, it was, you know, looked like the porch was completely on fire and that was going to collapse. That has your attention. Really, all you need to do is just take a few quick seconds to look at the fire, and you've got that. You know what's going on. There's probably, from the, from the amount of this house we could see, and you're looking at the picture right there, it's a pretty good shot of it. How much of this house right off the bat is, is basically you know it's a water job? It's going to be a line laid. You're going to put as much water on as you can. But are you saving anybody for most of this house? Are you saving any property for most of this house? As we got up closer, there was one spot in the house. That we, that we could see that caused us a little bit of pause. Everything else is just water. But, man, as we look around to that Bravo Charlie corner, and you can see it right there, one bedroom there would cause us a little bit of interesting thought. Is that a potential savable space? That's why I asked this question first in my decision-making process. Everything else I can kind of see. That's the question I would really want to focus on because what's my most important, what's the most significant issue? It's going to be whether or not I can grab somebody, whether somebody is alive inside the structure, and that is going to drive the bulk of my tactics, and it's going to drive what I'm willing to risk. Let me ask you this. If fire was blowing out of that window, how much are you willing to risk on this house? I mean, unless, unless we find a basement that we can't quite see, unless we have an addition onto the back, what we see of the house right here, we're not going to risk anything for this. We're just going to you know, have a little fun, put out some fire, and then, you know, go to the buck wagon and get a Gatorade. It'll be all over, you know, very shortly. But that window causes us to pause, and in particular on the front end, when you don't have as many bodies as you want, this is not test for lieutenant, test for captain, test for battalion chief, where you get to lay a backup, you get to lay a primary line, you get to lay a backup line, you get to lay a third line around the back of the structure. You get to get ventilation going. We're going to look for a search and rescue team to chase the hand line and maybe look at a vent inner search on Bravo Charlie for an exterior rescue. You've run out of bodies very quickly. You get to pick one or two things. You get to pick a couple assignments. What are the most important assignments? Here's where this becomes absolutely awesome. Four-fifths of this house is eliminated. It's on fire, and it's just going to be water. There is one possible place that we're going to go take a look at and see if that space changes what we do strategically and tactically. And as you drill with your troops, there's a lot of cool things that can happen here. You, you go, okay, let's walk up to that window. With the experience in the room, let's talk about what we might see in that window and what the cues we see in that window, what they might drive us to. That's where we talk about what does the glass look like, what do the curtains look like, if there's any kind of blind. Um, you can have a very robust discussion. Can you see through the window? Do you see smoke in the window? Can you see an open door? Can you see a body? Do you see fire? And talk about all those different cues and what they might mean to the survivability in that place. If we look at that window and it's orange inside there, it's full of fire, it just hasn't blown yet. But what's our risk? I mean, we have now zero, at least in what we can see, we have zero rescue profile, zero survivability. We are now just basically trying, you know, we're just not going to get hurt. No property to save. We risk nothing for this because it's already a done deal. However, we could talk about what's on the glass. How about if there's black stain on the glass with moisture running down? Is that survival? How about if it's cracked, if it's, if it's heated and dried and cracked? What if we, you can see smoke swirling around in there? All of these different cues would be an awesome thing to sit down with your crews and share your experience. Um, you know, just, just the one I'll share with you. I don't have, you know, I wish I could dazzle you with all the grabs I've got in my career. I really can. I mean, I haven't even got past, you know, true grabs. I haven't got past the second hand yet. Um, I, I'm still working on the second hand of, of, of grabs. But one I do have is a window, and the window had black on the window with moisture running down. Now, I didn't know at the time whether anybody was in there, but we went in. And sure enough, we found somebody, they were viable. I'm pretty sure they're probably still alive today. So as a cue, I know 
that if there is, is actual moisture running down the window, the moisture has started to go from the room because of heat, but it hasn't gotten too hot yet to kill the person inside the room because I have that experience. Share those experiences. That's the way you make this magical because now with your rescue profile, when you are out in front of a structure, you're taking all these different cues and experiences, all the stuff you read in Fire Engineer, all the fires that the people that you're looking at right now or the friends that you know or the, the, that your department has gone on, that you take the time to, to ask, what happened in the fire? What did you see? Why did you make the decisions that you made? Which ones were good? Which ones didn't work out? What do you wish you wouldn't have done? All of a sudden, that starts to become part of your slide tray, part of, if you will, your intuition. And when you go to the window, it's a very quick process. It's bang, bang, bang. Because you've talked about it, you draw an initial impression. Yes, I believe somebody could be alive in there. And that forces you to tactical decisions. Now you start to think, okay, vent inner search might be legit. If it's not survivable, why in the hell would you put somebody inside of a small window if it's not a survivable space? It makes no sense. You have to have a reason for what you're doing. Once you have that reason, once you've decided it, once it's decided in your mind, now you can move to your tactical decision. So answer me this. What does no survivable spaces mean in your mind for what you're willing to risk? What does it mean? I would hope that it, that it, that it indicates to you we're not going. If there's no survivable spaces, it is now property. And we save property all the time, and I think we should do that. And I love it when businesses stay in, in business because of what we do. But your risk at that point has now shrunk. You certainly are not in the risk everything mode. You're now at a risk that is, that is moderate and that is manageable and commensurate with what should happen in, in risking property. Now, here's the second one. Survivable space is one thing, and we'll have those. Now we want to go to, is there something that indicates that maybe somebody is in that survivable space? So here you go. Talk about the cues. What do you see in these cues that maybe interest you a little bit? Uh, if, you, if you're looking with other firefighters, you'll, you'll start to hear it going on. If you're writing it down, and I would suggest you do that, you know, writing things down, talking about it, making decisions, that's the way you actually learn. Is there somebody in this house? Well, if all you're focused on is the smoke, which the smoke's interesting, you know, I'll look at that for about two seconds, but what other cues are there? And using the model, let's go to it. Are there survivable spaces? Yes, there are. Is there a reasonable suspicion? And then you just tick through them. Well, we've got a car in the driveway, we've got multiple types of toys, which is a really cool cue, probably different sizes of kids in this deal, right? Is that, a, is that a type of structure that has people in it? Yeah, it's a residence, nighttime. So you know the potential exists even with something like this that might be you know, a little bit of an attic fire or some kind of extension off the back that, uh, yeah, they, they, they may be sleeping and they may have been overcome by gases and not even know it's on fire. Um, you know, I've heard all kinds of things. The, the, uh, the, the yard is mowed or taken care of. You know, that may be an indication. You've got chairs on the on the porch to indicate that maybe it's, it's a, a thing that's being used all the time. There's power. There's a light on over in the distance, so it's a neighborhood that has power. There are a thousand cues that you can share that give you the initial impression. So let me ask you, is this a go or a no-go? And I'm sure I would hear from across the country, I would hear, yeah, that's a go. We're going to go get these people. They're, they're okay. They're in decent shape. We're going to get them. That's the way it works. Here's a few cues. These are just ones that I wrote down. Your job is to go over and over and over the cues to, to share the cues that you know, to go find ones from other people who have been successful at fires. Your job is to expand that slide tray and expand those sets and reps using pictures, using videos, talking to others about fire, that when you actually get to it, you don't sit there and think, oh, man, is this, is this thing occupied? Boom. You look at it. Quick impression. This is a house. It's nighttime. People live here. There are survivable spaces. We can get this with the, this, the people that we have on scene. There's a car in the driveway. It's nighttime. This looks like an attic fire. We're going to rock and roll. We're going to go get those folks that fast. And your tactics decide themselves based upon that rapid of a decision-making process. And I would also say this. If you have survivable spaces, but there are no savable victims, what does that do to your risk profile? And again, you're in property mode at that point. At best, you're, you're at best in property mode. My hope is that your risk starts to reduce a little bit, and as your risk comes down, your tactical options start to decrease, and it's much quicker to get to a decision. Go or no go? Again, one for the truck captains in the audience. We've got to have some simple ones, you know, some softballs. If I, I, I can figure this one out. 
you know, for those of you who those of you who say this is a no go, nobody's survivable, at least in what we can see. Congratulations, you can be a truck captain in Seattle Fire. All right, how about this one? Go ahead and roll that video for me, if you would, Tammy. Okay, so, ah, man, what a cool little burn, huh? So you, you've been to that fire, a little small, little small house, and awesome that that fire, half the building, right off the bat, with a quick look, half the building is off your radar, right? That, that whole, as you look over to the front half of the Alpha side, the, the Bravo side around to Charlie, we can't see around the back, but what we see of the fire, half of that fire right off the bat, is off your radar strategically and tactically. You know that that's going to be a water job. You're going to throw as much water as you can on it, and that sucker is going to go out. The other half of the structure is where you have to make your decisions, particularly with the two, three, four, five, six, eight, ten bodies that you have on scene right now. You'll get more, but you've got to make your initial decisions based upon the bodies that you have on scene. What are you going to do with them? And again, all these different cues now, if you're evaluating them based on, if all you're doing is looking at the fire, that's just going to have your attention. Go to the process. Are there survivable spaces in that structure, and what's the likelihood that somebody's in there? It looked like, you know, most, most people that would look at it would say it looked like we at least have the potential for a survivable space, so we've got to, we've got to go investigate that. And all kinds of interesting things are happening. I know probably one of the things you asked yourself was, is that, is that smoke coming out of that window, or is that smoke that's rolling out of the E? Because that's, that's a big difference. You pop up to that window, you do all the things that we talked about, you look in the window to see what, what's happening with the window, you'll know if the smoke is blowing out of the, out of the window frame. And if it's chugging out of that window at that type of pressure, that tells you that the smoke is to the floor and it's fairly thick. We only got it. We don't have long before anybody who is alive in there is going to be in, in they're going to be not viable. Now you get to make your tactical decision. What's it going to be? That will go, what will decide that is goes a long way towards whether or not you feel that bedroom, that Alpha Delta bedroom, is survivable. There may be a window on the other side, on the Delta side, that gives you a clearer picture. But this is the way that going with cues, that going with rescue profile, gets you out of the grass, gets you out of, of you know, trying to decide three or four things, and now you've got only a few bodies that you get to, to plug in. What's your decision? Is your decision... A, a nice hit at that doorway, kind of anticipating that you're going to have a hallway just to the right that's going to get you those bedrooms. Hope you got a closed door. Can you knock down enough fire to be able to make that viable? Or is your decision that you're going to look at maybe a hit from the outside and, and possibly a vent in a search? You at least now, you've narrowed it down to a couple tactics, and now you decide based upon what you have on scene. And please hear me, how you train, 
what you've trained at. Look, if you haven't trained uh, on, on Venon or Search or whatever you call it, I know there's 8,000 names to call it now because everybody freaks out. I don't care what you call it. Are you going to go through that window? Are you going to go through that window to go get somebody? You're going to go through the door and try to get them through the house. There's your tactical decision, but look how nice it is. You now are down to, from 20, you're down to two. And now with the, with the resources you have, you make the decision on what's going to be the best way to attack the fire and get to those folks. That is really how simple it is. Now, that's the rescue profile. There's more to the rescue profile. I've got you know, only a short amount of time with you, so I've got to clip through this and keep moving. You can, you can add layers to it as you practice it. You can add more and more layers and get better and better. I would encourage you not to overcomplicate it at first. Start out slow. Start out with, I mean, listen, if you will do one thing at your next fire, just pause and ask yourself the question, are there survivable spaces in this structure? You will go a long way towards determining what the most appropriate strategic and tactical approach to the fire is. As you practice this, as you, as you get more people involved, as you, as you talk about, about fires more, and you start to develop a list of, of all these different cues, and you go over them and over them and over them and over them again, it becomes less of a trial. Now it, it starts to come to you. It starts to pop up in your mind, and it becomes, again, as we would describe, it becomes intuitive. So now building. We'll just look at this real quick. What conditions exist to enable our actions? Um, you, you, you've, you've established a lot of your risks with your rescue profile, and some of your primary tactics are already starting to come into focus. Now we're going to look at the building. The first thing I want to know, I mean, I, there's a thousand things to think about with building construction. The first thing I want to know, especially if I have rescue, what is the collapse potential? And you know, very simply, is it going to fail? How is it going to fail? Which direction? Is it going to come down? Is it going to come from the Bravo side, the Delta side? Is it going to come out at me on the Alpha side? And what's a basic time frame? Do I have an inkling of what the basic time frame is? Now here you go. Here, here's your question, softball. Is this going to collapse? And I heard a, a chorus of hundreds of firefighters across the nation saying, yes, dummy, and it's already started to collapse. And it looks like the good folks there are outside, so you know, we, as a warm-up, we get a collapse. Here is an awesome little video to watch that shows you some of the different ways that even in a little residence, a little house, here's some of the ways that things can drop. Let's take a, take a watch and enjoy. And roll that video. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what, Tammy? Just because I want this to be cool and fun for everybody, um, roll that again so they can watch it again. Folks, watch the different types of collapse here. You had, you had the 90-degree collapse, and I think that's a good image to have in your head. You saw how a porch, you know, that, that, that typical collapsing of the pillars, that, that front alpha wall did that fold that we hear about that, you know, we'll see with, with so much different construction. And then, of course, what did the roof do? You know, just a pancake. Watch these videos. It, it's critical. If I had more time with you, I would show you more houses and, and structures that are about to collapse, and we'll never know 100%. Sometimes buildings just fail, and we don't see it. But what we're trying to do is give ourselves the best chance possible to anticipate and determine when, when things are going to happen. And one of the ways to do that is just to watch buildings that collapse. Now we go to type of construction. You know, of course, th that's going to give you an indication of, of, of how quickly it's going to collapse, where it's going to collapse, and very important, it goes to fire spread. Whole books are written on this, okay? We just had John Mittendorf and Dave Dodson in to do the Art of Reading Buildings in Seattle, and, and wonderful that our leaders brought them in to us. But there's a lot of knowledge out there that you can get, even if you're not a builder and maybe you're not good at it, you can get good at it. Go to these classes. Get these textbooks. Invest in your career. Put a little, you know, put a little money into your career and, and make some investment into it and share it with your fellow brothers and sisters. This is just a few things. You know, again, a few cues. Few deals, 
Um, you know, there, there's whole books and whole classes written on this. And certainly, you know, one that I don't want to skip by is type of occupancy. That's going to, that's going to drive a lot of your tactics. What, what, what are the occupants in it? Who, who are they likely to be? Are, are like a lot, of, a lot of them in my district, you know, folks that are, that are troubled and have some challenges and, and maybe some elderly, non-ambulatory. Uh, what's burning in there? What are the contents? You know, is this a, is this a, uh, a, a furniture warehouse, you know, with basically gas cans all over the place? They're just in the form of furniture. You know, or, or, or is it a vacant? Um, is it is it a, a steel plant? Is it, you know, what is it? All these different cues. You can read them as well as I can, and this is a great thing to, to drill and test on. Well, let's take a quick look at this one. Um, run that video for me, if you would. Okay, um, boy, I hope I, I can hear the the wheels turning all over the place. You know, um, the, uh, the the vacant fire question is a big deal, and then again, this goes to occupancy, right? And we look at this, and right, and right off the bat, we see you know heavy, intense. You know, you're, you're reading smoke, folks. That that smoke off in that Charlie Delta corner. I mean, that is some nasty, angry smoke. And we saw a little bit of fire around the front door, and of course, once that door got peeled off. We see that there was heavy fire throughout the structure. I, I bring this. I put this one up just to you know the, the tactical stuff in this one is going to be fairly straightforward and fairly easy. It looks like there's fire throughout the structure. Maybe as we as we open it up a little, maybe we find a space that might have some survivability to it. But you should answer the vacant building question and the derelict building question. You should answer some of those things on the front end. What are you willing to risk? And, and once again, if your if your approach is it's on fire. We're going in full tilt no matter what it is. You don't need to make any decisions. The decision's already made. For those of us who have been in a lot of vacant building fires and we've been in a lot of vacant structures, there is a recognition that there are some dangers inherent with this within these that make a little bit slower of a go very much necessary if you, if you don't want to get hurt unnecessarily. I am down 100% for going in and getting folks that are, that are on their, down on their luck and, and squatting in these buildings. There are typically indications. If you did a quick 360 of this, there would be indications with plywood peeled off or something. They have to get in somewhere. If you go around this structure and it looks like what you see in the front, it is locked up and boarded up tight with plywood, there's nobody in there. And so now you're in what type of mode? Property or life? Again, evaluating survivable spaces then moves you to we have no survivable spaces or we do. Now we move the building. Is this going to collapse? No, it's not going to collapse. Well, how's it built? You know, it's a frame building. What type of occupancy? Well, it's a residence, but it's vacant. All of those recognitions start to narrow down what you're willing to do based upon who you have on scene and the risk that you're willing to take for the structure that's in front of you. This would very much be for me, folks. This would be one that I would be putting some water on and seeing what I got going before I go, go pounding in there. Um, you get to make those calls, and here's the thing. This is why it's important. You live with the consequences of the decisions you make, and for many of you, if not now, it's coming. You're going to be in the one. You're going to be the one in the yard that's looked upon 
to make these decisions. It's why you got to practice, practice, practice. Okay, do your process. Are there survivable spaces? Yeah, it looks like it. You know, as we head down the way there, it looks like there are. What's the likelihood somebody's in there? Well, it's businesses at night. You know, some of us are in districts where sometimes people live inside these businesses. Looks like, you know, Henry's Hobby House is pretty pretty tough. You know, the, the, the folks in there are having a tough time. The fire's certainly running. It's running along the top. And then we see to the right, what do we see? You know, is this going to collapse on us right away? Well, I don't, like it, the, the, I don't like that overhang at Henry's Hobby House. But as we go down the way, it looks like we could do some work. And I see an open sign. That kind of looks like a, a trick. I don't know that anybody's there this time of night, but we got an open sign. As we get up to those windows, we'll make an evaluation. As you move down the building, all of a sudden, your tactics start to come into view based upon what it is that you're trying to save. Are you going to put firefighters up on that roof? Well, we evaluate the risk. You know, we, we evaluate what's happening. Is there any, is, are we saving any life or are we just saving property? Now we're in property mode. Again, we save property all the time, but that narrows down and that limits our risk a little bit. The building profile will go a long way towards determining what risk you're going to take, particularly, hear me, particularly in property mode where it starts to be a little more questionable about what we're going to do with our firefighters. And the final thing, because of time, you know, I'll, I'll move a little quick, but, you know, I want you to get at the fire profile. And you're going to see the fire, gang, all right? I'm, it, it, you're not going to peel off of the fire. You're going to see it. You've got to force yourself to look at other things besides the fire. And I'm not diminishing the fire. What, watching and seeing what the fire is doing, where it's going, where it is, absolutely critical, and it will probably be one of the first things you notice. I'm trying to get you to the other things that are a little more diminished that really help your, your strategic and tactical decisions. There's some stuff for fire. Where's the fire? What's it doing? Are reading smoke, folks? What's the smoke doing? What is the smoke telling you? Where is it progressing to? Where is the fire and how far has the fire progressed? The first question I want to know that I, that I try to look at and I get myself to is not how pretty it is or what color the fire is or all of that kind of stuff. You know, that's interesting. Look. Is it vent limited or fuel limited? What do I mean by that? What's a vent limited fire? You tell me. Vent limited fire needs what? It's oxygen, right? So what's that? Is that sucker vent limited or fuel limited? You know, and I would suggest that ain't limited at all. It's going to burn until it burns. It's going to burn until it runs out of fuel. And, and there you go. Rock on. Um, how about this one? This one's, more, this one's more typical of what we're seeing nowadays. How about this one? Is that a little more limited? It's kind of got that ugly, nasty smoke. That smoke is really all it's wanting, folks. It just wants a little bit of oxygen. If it could just get the air it wants, it would turn a bright, beautiful orange, and everything would be glorious for that fire. Recognizing that on the front end will really drive your tactics, and I hope will drive the intensity with which you insert yourself into the building. There are some things we can do on these vent-limited fires that keep them from lighting off, and, you know, then... We, we don't want to be a YouTube sensation. We don't want to be the next group of firefighters on YouTube that are tumbling out of the building with fire blowing on or out around us when it, you know, it lit off while we were inside or we had a smoke explosion. We really want to pay attention to what's happening with these vent-limited fires. Second question, how involved is the fire? Now you tell me. Here we go. Is that a go or a no-go? Well, when I do these classes, all the time from the classes, I hear no-go. Because of the fire, because what are we focused on? We're focused on the intensity of that fire. But as you, as you look a little closer at the structure and you get your eyes off the fire, run through the process. Are there survivable spaces? What's the answer? Well, you know, it looks like it. I mean, we, we may get to it and we may find that what's on the other side of that window is nasty and uninhabitable, but we see cars in the driveway, we see people standing out in the yard, and the guts of the fire is in that half story, and I'll grant you that's glorious and that's that's a, that's a lot of fire, man. But if, if we're really looking at what good tactics are, that first floor has some real areas we can work in, and in a bare minimum, wouldn't you at least, if you can, wouldn't you want to get that door open and at least see if somebody's on the other side of that door and couldn't get out, even if you couldn't go into the house any further, if the, if the conditions didn't warn you? Wouldn't for your peace of mind, wouldn't you like to take a quick look in that door? As you look at it and you run the process, all of a sudden, this goes from a no-go because of all that spectacular fireworks show on the roof, and it goes to a go because of survivable spaces. I think that's the way the process works, and it works pretty well. Just a few things. 
you know, get your terminology right. What does fully involved mean? You really confuse us when you say fully involved and we show up and half the house is on fire and half isn't. Um, you know, really, you know, all the way down the list here. And, you know, again, this list should be 100 items long and growing. Really think about the wind. What's happening with the wind? Is it helping us? Is it harming us? Um, those types of things. There, there's also smoke profile. Um, you know, let me let me just briefly do it. Um, I, I, I don't have a ton of time left, and I, I want to make this reasonable for you. You know, my buddy Paul Combs is, is, is correct here, and, and he's mirroring what Dave Dodson has told us. The smoke's predicting the future. And you know these things. You can get Dave's stuff, so I, I don't have to run through it with you all the way. Volume, velocity, density, color. That becomes also a very big part of the fire profile, and it's going to be really important for you if, uh, if you're going to do this well. Now, recognize these three things are not, you don't just stay on one and stay there for the whole fire. This is a brief overview of what I think is a very powerful tool. And I hope I get to spend more time with you somewhere, either at FDIC or I, I hope I get to, you know, maybe see you at one of your fire departments and, and do a class there and we can dig down in this and do lots of sets and reps and look at lots of videos. Um, you know, but you don't need me, gang. You can do this. Um, you can, you know, you, you can get the, the basic PowerPoint of this or, you know, just what you've written down or go through this little bit and you can build this for yourselves. You can get the videos. You can get the pictures. Get on YouTube and, and just go through them and evaluate the different things. You will, for the duration of the fire, you will cycle through rescue profile, building profile, fire profile. You'll be in one, then you'll be in the other. You'll get a cue for one. You'll get a cue from the other. And what that ends up doing, which is awesome and amazing, is it's a continual update of what your impression is and what now are the best things to do given what we have right now. Five minutes ago, we had a certain amount of information and we had an impression and we laid a pre-connect through the front door with a, with a positive pressure fan coming in and a primary search team coming in. And, th and that hose line made no difference. And the fire is getting worse. Well, our tactic obviously didn't work. And maybe we're going to pull them out. We're going to look at a different place to get to the building. You're updating it all the time. But if you, if you spend some time in these and you train on them and you practice on them, they're going to be incredible for you. Let me, let me just do a couple more things for you here. There's my email address. If you want to email me, you know, I can, uh, I'll, I'll send you the distribution PowerPoint of this. It's Mikey J at AOL.com, or you can get me on Facebook under, under Mike Galliano somewhere on there. I'm on there somewhere. Just real quick, as we close out, this didn't take me long to put together. You do this, and this is what you can do for your company. You tell me, using the process, are we a go or a no-go? Go or no-go? This is an awesome picture because the minute you see it, you see all that fire, you see all that terrible stuff, and a lot of people will say no go. Well, go to the process. Are there survivable spaces? Well, if you look a little further, all kinds of them. And the fire is awesome and beautiful, but that ain't the total picture. Get your eyes off the fire. Go or no go? Go or no go? And man, don't tell me that there's a little unburned space down there on the on the Alpha Delta corner there by the by the tower. Don't tell me that. that build, this building wants to drop on you and kill you. This is a no-go. Uh, no go or no-go. Half the audience will look at that and they will say, that's a vacant. I'm not going to risk a firefighter's life in this. And, you know, the other half, as we talk about it, will say, you know, I have whole neighborhoods that look like that. And just because the garage door is off and, you know, it looks like it might be it, I can be nobody there. I have whole neighborhoods that look like that, and, and the, every one of the houses is lived. Is that a, is, are there survivable spaces? Yeah, you bet. Man, does that fire allow for, for at least some checking in to see what's going on? You bet. To go. Go or no go. Boy, all the cues are there, aren't they, gang? All the cues are there. for This, this could be a place that people live. we got heavy fire, looks like, over to that. That, uh, that left corner there, probably up into the attic, ripping and rolling, and a glorious fire thing coming out of that, coming out of those eaves. But look at the window where people live. Is that a go or a no go? Go or no go? You know, and I would just here's a tip for you. This one's for free from from the truck captain. If you look over to that blue building and you look at that window, when you can see the sky through the will through the window, 
probably a good idea not to go in there. Probably a no-go. We could talk a little bit about the one to the left then on the music center, but uh, certainly the one to the right, no-go. And, you know, the final thing, and, you know, I, I sure appreciate you hanging out with me. Look at this. Go or no-go. This one encapsulates a lot of what we're talking about. You look at this, this kind of strikes you initially as, whew, man, that's a lot of fire. That, nobody's alive there. And then as you look to the lower corner, look down at that little bedroom down there in the little basement. I don't know if anybody's in there, gang. I have no clue. But I know that I would want to take a look at that because people do live in basements. This type of fire is going to cut off the stairs. And if, if we end up determining nobody's in there, that's great. But we definitely want to check that out. In that respect, and certainly around the back, this is a go. Go or no go? <laughs> I hope, I hope it's a unanimous no. And the final thing, and hey, thank you for hanging out with me today. Th this has been a blast for me. I've enjoyed it. I hope you've gotten a little bit of benefit out of this. I at least hope it's gotten your gears going. Is that a go or a no-go? <laughs> if you got to go, you got to go. Hey, thank you so much. Um, I, I really genuinely appreciate Fire Engineer and letting me do this. I, I'm so thankful to Honeywell for, for uh, giving the ability to put this on. You know, get a hold of me if you'd like a copy of the distribution PowerPoint. I'll send that to you. And um, just, just thanks a lot. I, I appreciate you all so much. I am very proud to be in this in this calling with you, and I and I hope it was helpful. Thanks, and Pete. I guess I'll uh, turn it back to you. All right, Mike. I uh, we really thank you very much for for this uh, presentation. I know you're short on time, so I think we'll probably have to skip the Q and A session today. Correct. Uh, but we will send you the uh, send the uh, questions that we got from Mike. Uh, we'll, we'll forward them on to him, and he will take care of them, and we'll post them on the Fire Engineering website. Um, thank you all for tuning in today, and uh, you will be able to either get with Mike to get the PowerPoint, uh, or we will later upload this if you revisit us on the archive. Um, and we'd also, again, like to thank, once again, Honeywell. Please come. If you're coming to FDIC, check them out at the show, booth 1610. And you can also get them at HoneywellFirstResponder.com. Uh, we'll have an archive of this one in about 24 hours, and you'll be able to get at it from the home page at FireEngineering.com. We'll also send you a reminder email message that will have a link to the archive so you can download whatever you need to download or Rewatch this one uh, to get some of the details again. Uh, thanks again to Mike for this presentation, and uh, please join us for future webcasts on fire engineering.